please welcome Paul Bennett. Thanks for the introduction, Stan. And thanks for having me here today. How many have seen my book, The Owl and the Woodpecker? Okay, a few people. I wrote that book several years ago because I have always, since I was a young guy, been fascinated by plants and animals that have families of plants and animals with many members because it's with many members that we see how each has evolved to take advantage of unique elements of habitat. And in that way, they really paint the picture. They add texture, color, voice, behavior to what might otherwise seem like wood and leaves. Owls are almost always what are called indicator species, meaning that the presence and the relative population of an owl tells us the health of an ecosystem. Woodpeckers are what are called keystone species, meaning that they alter the habitat for the benefit of other species, including more than half the owl species that rely upon the woodpecker species for their cavities. So 22 woodpecker species, 19 owl species, between these I found a way to tell the story of North American habitats and show us where our stewardship is required to maintain the elements that are important to these animals and important to us. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the themes of the book, show some images, but also talk about how owls and woodpeckers are also dependent upon wolves. And this is probably surprising to some, but it draws in, draws together two exhibits currently at the Burke Museum right now, one, the owl and the woodpecker, and one opening on Saturday on wolves. So without further ado, why are woodpeckers and owls important to us? They are for a number of reasons. The common flicker, for instance, is important not only because it's a beautiful animal, but it has a tongue that reaches two and a half inches beyond the tip of the bill, allowing it to snare termites and carpenter ants from our homes and from trees. Woodpeckers, flickers, I should say, also create cavities, cavities of the perfect size for more than 30 species of birds, many amphibians, many mammals. In my research, I learned that each cavity nesting animal prefers a cavity or a hole of a particular size in a particular place on a tree. Each woodpecker creates a cavity of a different size. With 22, there are 22 sizes, and many animals prefer a very specific size. For instance, a sawwood owl prefers the exact size created by the northern flicker. Notice that also that, that sawwood owl has a rodent. Owls do a phenomenal job of removing rodents around our homes, businesses, farms, and have that value to us and our economies. Screech owls also find the flicker cavities to be the exact right size and will disappear if these cavities are not available. As we travel across North America, the calls, the soundtrack, if you will, to many of the habitats are the calls of the owls at night and the woodpeckers by the day. And in the coastal forests of the Northwest, the call that is declining is a call of the northern spotted owl. And the sported, spotted owl requires older forests, not for the age of the tree, but for the structure of that forest. The multiple canopies, trees of different sizes, that create multiple canopies that allow this bird to thermoregulate. So that on the warmest of days, this owl will move into the lower parts of the forest where it can stay cool. And then on cooler days, it will move higher to stay warm. This owl is challenged by its habitat being fragmented, but also now by another owl, the barred owl, which is moving into some of the territory and furthering the challenges of conservation efforts for the spotted owl. Now it's important to note, and I note this quite a bit in my book, the story is about the owls, but the messages reverberate for us and for a wide range of animals. 
Few of us are concerned about protecting this habitat for this one animal alone, but we all should be concerned about a habitat being eliminated before we understand the importance it has for us, not just for its beauty, but for the way that we can take advantage of these resources in a sustainable way that both helps the economy, our way of life, and a quality of life. <laughs> the pileated woodpecker is an incredibly important animal. This animal creates the largest cavities of any bird in North America. Cavities that are exactly the right size for a number of animals. In fact, the organization I work for, Conservation Northwest, brought back the Pacific Fisher to the Olympic Peninsula with the, in conjunction with the Department of Wildlife. But in order to find the appropriate habitat, we had to make sure there are pileated woodpeckers creating the nest cavities that fishers could inherit to raise their young. For those of you who hunt, wood ducks, mergansers, many other birds use the cavities created by the pileated woodpecker and their populations would suffer declines without it. But the pileated woodpecker also softens trees. And by softening these trees, diminutive little birds like the downy woodpecker who would otherwise not be able to live, not be able to create a cavity to live in, are able to attack softer trees. As we move east up into the Cascades, the diverse forest with a wide range of conifers occurs. And there are many owls and woodpeckers that take advantage of these areas. One of the most important is the hairy woodpecker, a common woodpecker that creates a medium-sized cavity of the perfect size for many animals, including the western bluebird and the northern pygmy owl. The northern pygmy owl is in a size a ferocious little owl that's five inches tall, but the owl takes not only rodents, but it will take snakes many times its length, or even a bat three times its size. The fall colors we appreciate tell us that the trees in this area are rich with sap. And there are woodpeckers that take advantage of the sap-rich trees to drill wells. Wells that draw in insects that they might eat and wells that draw other animals north. The migratory sap suckers create the wells in the winter to feed on, but at that time they have two to three percent sugar. When the trees leaf out, Suddenly they have 13 to 17 percent sugar. Hummingbirds across North America time their migration to take advantage of these sugar-rich wells. These are essentially these sap suckers, the pied pipers for many animals. Several woodpecker and owl species rely upon unique, unique features of pine forests. For instance, in the east, the red cockaded woodpecker is a small woodpecker, five inches tall, takes three to five years for this animal to create its cavity. This animal, being so small, is very vulnerable to predation, particularly from climbing snakes. So this woodpecker chooses a live tree. And even though it'll take it five years to build a cavity, that live tree allows the woodpecker to keep a constant flow of sap flowing across the front of the cavity so that woodpeckers, that snakes and mammals cannot get up and steal the young or prey upon the nests. In our area, the white-headed woodpecker uses that white head to shine light down into the cones to more quickly find the seeds. In, in creating breeding cavities, the animal creates a number of holes. And again, these holes end up being the perfect size for other animals, such as the flammulated owl. A remarkable owl that migrates three to 5,000 miles every year from Central and South America up to the mountains of the West, arriving in the mountains when snow is still flying, when temperatures are often sub-freezing. But yet, this animal relies upon entirely upon flying insects. How does it survive? Well, it specializes in a specific niche in the forest, a niche that provides habitat for the noctuid and the owlet moths. Moths that have a natural antifreeze in their blood, allowing them to fly at sub-freezing temperatures, allowing this bird to survive in the early season after this long migration. Where does this moth live? This moth lives where old-growth ponderosa pine and old-growth dug fir mix. In other words, 
north facing slopes, the Ponderosa Pine Zone, or the upper reaches of the Ponderosa Pine Zone. Many of the stories are like that, specific niches by remarkable birds that rely upon us and our stewardship to stick around. Oak habitats throughout the West are great habitats for several woodpecker species. The Lewis woodpecker, named after and by Meriwether Lewis. This woodpecker hunts insects on the fly. But the oak habitats don't have a lot of insects in the winter. It's close relative of the yeast. The red-headed woodpecker, like the loose woodpecker, is forced to roam the countryside in the winter searching for food. But one woodpecker, the acorn woodpecker, has learned to breed cooperatively and create granaries that can store up to 50,000 acorns, each hole being drilled custom fit for the species of acorn found in that area. The deserts of the southwest also have a story to be told by the woodpeckers. The blossoms of the saguaro open for only 24 hours in the entire life. And during that 24-hour period, before that blossom close, it needs to be pollinated, and woodpeckers help in the pollination. They also create the cavity of exactly the right size for the ferruginous pygmy owl. A lot of us, how many people enjoy hiking or, or being out in the outdoors? For a lot of us, the fires in recent years have been tragic. Tragic and they burned a lot of our favorite places. But the fire is also a beginning. And there are owls and woodpeckers that tell us about this beginning. Here a forest in the Cascades begins to recover. And if you look closely, you can see the marks created by the blackback woodpecker. The blackback woodpecker arrives in these forests while the trees are still smoking. It hears the insects preying upon these trees. It comes in and for two years when those insects are alive, these birds literally attack the trees. Normally this is a rare bird, but it's an important bird for us. Anyone heard of the mountain pine beetle or the spruce budworm? The blackback woodpeckers are a natural control agent for these pests. But it's normally a rare bird you might have one in a hundred miles of Cascade Forest. But when a burn breaks out, you might have two to three pairs in an acre. So the young of these birds then replenish the forest to fight some of these forest pests that are bad now, but will become worse with climate change. Mountain bluebirds and other birds use the nest cavities created by the blackback woodpecker. The boreal forest covers much of Canada and Alaska, and it's a swath of green with several habitats, habitats that are delineated very easily by the strategy, the hunting strategies of some of the resident owls. And by the way, because of our mountains, these owls are also found in the Cascades. The boreal owl that prefers the closed canopy parts of the boreal forest, and the largest owl in North America, the great gray owl. And watch as this owl with a five-foot wingspan floats silently while hunting in an open meadow. This bird flew within inches of my face, yet I did not hear a single sound until it crashed through the snow and ice behind me. This light two-pound bird can break through snow and ice capable of carrying the weight of a 180-pound person and still come up with prey. The northern hawk owl, an owl that hunts, the great gray hunts using its ears, the hawk owl hunts using its eyes. And while the great gray floats off perches, the northern hawk owl snaps into a vertical dive, always keeping its eyes on its prey and diving in quickly to snatch it before bringing it back to the young. And the open landscapes, while many of the owls and woodpeckers are species of the trees, the open landscapes of the West also host owls and woodpeckers, such as the burrowing owl, an owl that is at home in agricultural areas of the Columbia Plateau, where it helps control pests for farmers. The short-eared owl, an owl of dusk that hunts using its hearing floating across the sky, benefited 
from the fact it has very little weight for each inch of wing. And finally, the snowy owl. The first owl I ever saw was a snowy owl. And I was paying attention to the rhythms of nature, and I made a note of when it took, when I saw it, but I didn't see another snowy owl for 30 years. Every several years, they show up in the Northwest, reminding us of the challenges of their Arctic habitat. A brutal place where survival is still challenging for these great birds when things are healthy. With the climate changing, the Arctic is bearing the brunt of the early changes. As a hedge in a brutal environment, the snowy owls have several chicks, each chick born two days apart. So you can see the age difference in this family. In an unpredictable environment, when you spread your young out, you give each a better chance of surviving. Usually not all will. Usually at least one or two will survive. Now what do owls and woodpeckers have to do with wolves? Most owls and woodpeckers live in forests. And most of these animals nest in riparian areas, in areas where there's waters, streams, lakes, ponds. And most of the trees in these areas are aspen, cottonwood, birch. These are trees that grow quickly, but they also have short lives. And what I noticed that was alarming when I was working on my book, The Owl and the Woodpecker, is that in much of North America, we had very old trees, but we didn't have a lot of young trees coming up. I'm talking about the deciduous trees, those ones I just mentioned. So you had these old trees with nest cavities and no new trees coming up. Why was that? Mainly due to grazing. Grazing of both cattle, but grazing of ungulates, elk, moose, deer. What's happened is these animals come in and they, they find a good food spot. They stay there until they've exhausted it. Yellowstone had the same problem. And in Yellowstone, they were finding years ago that the aspen and the birch were not growing. We only had the old trees. And this is one of my favorite photo spots when I was working on my book. There were seven species of owls and ten woodpeckers in that one place. In Yellowstone, they noticed the same thing until they brought back the wolves. But once they brought back the wolves, what they noticed that the deer and the elk and the moose were no longer staying in one place all day because wolves were a part of the landscape. So instead, these ungulates moved on spending only a short time in each place, eating some of the small trees, but allowing many to survive and have future generations of the trees that owls and woodpeckers would rely upon. But that's just the beginning, the beginning of something called a trophic cascade. And a trophic cascade means that many life, many animals and many systems were impacted by those wolves. For instance, the reemergent vegetation brought in beavers. Beavers prefer to use that vegetation for dams. The beaver dams created little offshoots, slower moving water for trout and salmon. Songbirds were suddenly able to find more nesting habitat behind those dams. The habitats were more alive. And in the Northwest, a few years ago, the organization I work for, Conservation Northwest, captured the first images of wolves returning to Washington State. They have returned on their own. And we're hoping that we're going to see the same impacts on these ecosystems as the wolves survive and as they regenerate some of these systems in Washington and other parts of North America. So, oops, I have a slight image problem here and we'll make an adjustment. The last thing I'll, I'll share with you is that we have an exhibit right now around the owl and the woodpecker at the Burke Museum and where there's also a wolf exhibit. So you have a chance to explore, that's not going to work, we'll have a chance to explore some of these issues I talked about today. But the real message is that, then my reason for talking to you today is that everything is intertwined the owl, the woodpecker, and the wolf. But none of it will survive and be sustainable or resilient without our support. Thank you very much for having me today.
Thank you very much, Paul. There is time for questions and answers. Um, uh, and again, I'll call on people with the mic floor mics, and so get their attention, and then you'll all have their turn. Um, all right. Anybody have a question? Don Kraft right here. Those are incredible pictures. How long do you have to stand in the woods to just get, find one of those? Well, I, I feel like I need the admiral to tap me occasionally and keep me awake. Um, they, thank you for the compliment. Um, the images do take a long time to, to, um, to find, and I, I find that... Um, if I, didn't, if I did not love the exploring and the learning, I couldn't do it. And so it really doesn't feel like waiting. It feels like learning. Uh, but I figure for my book, the 200 images in my book, I spent probably two to 3,000 hours of field time for those 200 images. But, you know, it might be two weeks where I won't get a single image, and then I might get five, Im five really good images in a half an hour. Hard to predict. Thank you. This is really informative and lovely work. Uh, can you make a comment about the uh, wolves being uh, mm, taken off a list and being hunted in in uh, the Yellowstone area, Montana, I guess, or yep. where that would be? Please, your sure your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, the question was for me to comment upon uh, the wolves being delisted in the Yellowstone area and. Um, Really, how that impacts Washington, I think, is, is probably the next implied part of the question. Uh, wolves have been taken off the endangered species list in, in the, in the um, Rocky Mountain ecosystem, which includes Montana, Idaho, and there are some negotiations going on right now for eastern Washington as well, all the way up to Highway 97. Um, for me, I'll make something very clear. For me, it is not, wolves are not about the essence of it being a wildlife, uh, it being an animal, and I don't think we should kill the animals. Inevitably, we will have to cull wolves. And anyone, all of us supporting the introduction of wolves recognize that at some point, there will be too many wolves. But that point is not now. Um, the fear is that wolves are going to wipe out um, populations of deer and elk and, and other animals that, that hunters want to hunt and that perhaps economies rely upon for hunting licenses and, and whatnot. Um, there really is no evidence to support that. The wolves do change the behavior of animals, though. Uh, for, for, for everyone who's a hunter out there, they make animals tougher to find because they will be more on the run and on the move, which means that hunters will have to do more hunting. But the, they will not wipe out their food source. Eventually, though, if wolves are recovered, wolves, wolves will need to be culled back in certain areas where there could be conflicts with livestock. Um, that would be the main issue. What's happened in, in Montana and Idaho is it's become very political. And um, it's, a, it's a very polarizing issue. And so a, a stand was made. Right now, we're, we're working to have establishment of targets in Washington, how many wolves do we need to have before we consider populations recovered? And that number of wolves will be different in different parts of the state. It's not a lot of wolves. And even when they're fully recovered, most of us will never see a wolf. Uh, Ken? Of all the spots that you visited, uh, which is the region or, or location that most touched you? Um, which of all the spots I visited, which is the region that most touched me? Really, <laughs> my, my honest answer, the last one I was at, or the one I'm currently at, normally. But if I was to stand where I am today, where I haven't been out in the field in a few days, um, it would be two places. One would be the dry forests of the northwest, meaning open ponderosa pine mixed with aspen. I, I just find those delightful, the red bark of the trees, being able to see far ahead, being able to make a, a path and, and go to places where there are no trails and be able to walk for days and, and not have too much rain. And the other one is, is various parts of Alaska, 
just for the pure wildness and and um, the surprising ecosystems. Question back here. As a photographer myself, I'm curious about what equipment you use. What equipment do I use? Um, I'm agnostic when it comes to equipment. I say that because there's always a battle among photographers of is Canon better, is Nikon better, and I think, you know, we're, technology is changing so quickly, and, and having spent a career in software, I learned very quickly that you, um, you need to pick one of the contending horses and stay on it, and when I was in film, I, the horse I was on was Nikon, and then I switched to Canon with digital, and I have to say that I kick myself sometimes, <laughs> but I use Canon equipment, 1D, 5D, and 7D camera, mostly fixed lenses. I'm uh, mulling over, I think, your last comment when you said they need our support to survive. And I understand how an organization like yours needs support, and I understand how we can screw up what they do, but woodpeckers are going to do what woodpeckers are going to do, wolves are going to do what wolves are going to do. What do we do that helps and doesn't hurt? What do you mean by they need our support? That's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Why do, wood, why do woodpeckers, owls, and wolves need our support? Beyond what conservation organizations do, what can all of you and, and all of us, I should say, do as individuals? There are a few key issues, and the most important one is to recognize that conservation organizations like ours are not saying lock it all up and protect it all. That's silly. We all want jobs. We all want a strong economy. We all want homes. We all want opportunity. But we can be smart about decisions we make. The most important thing that we can do is figure out what are the most important pieces of habitat and connect them. Because one of the, one of the um, fortunate accidents of natural history and political history is that we've preserved a lot of our mountain ranges and, and by accident of nature, many of our mountain ranges are north-south. That's a real good thing with climate change. Now, no matter why you think climate change is occurring, it is occurring. Wildlife, if we can build connected landscapes, then wildlife can use that connectivity to move to the appropriate habitat so we don't have to lock everything up. If we protect swaths of habitat and the temperature increases five degrees here, then wildlife can follow what, what are being called corridors, although that implies a small area, so I don't like to use that term, but they can follow these connected landscapes north or up a mountain or down a mountain. If we don't connect habitat, then animals and plants are isolated to islands. And islands, if you have climate change, eventually they're going to dry up. Eventually they won't support them. So what can you do? You can support organizations with time, with money that connect habitat. Number one. Number two, think of the land that you impact, whether it be your home, vacation homes, whatever, as potential connective habitats. Thank you very much, Paul. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health 